the next topic of the day. None other than our join in pediatrics. Dr. Y.K. Amdekar is with us and it is failure to thrive. From in utero to fetus to infant, the child should grow and glow. And it entails a gamut of diagnosis, but maybe just that it is inadequate nutrients or improper nutrients. Both can be there and there can be other maladies. Dr. Amdekar, person who always sensitizes us to think, maximize our clinical acumen, elaborate and arrive at a plausible diagnosis with the first two. Then and only then will he ask for investigations. This will maximize benefits and minimize expenditure. Sir, you. Well, at the outset, uh, thank you very much to Chennai Pedicon and the Tamil Nadu State Conference. Uh, I'm grateful for this invitation. I think when I was asked to talk about the failure to thrive, the first thing that I wanted to be sure is that we need to confirm what is failure to thrive. Many times I thought that it is not a very well understood term, and I think to that extent, uh, it is a growth faltering more than two standard deviation, which is a significant faltering over a short period, which results in marked lowering of weight, but length is not much affected, at least in the initial stage and it's always a serious background cause and a subsequent development of, of course, the protein energy malnutrition. The point that I want to make is that a failure to thrive is different than just the chronic malnutrition. A failure to thrive occurs in a very short time and that tells a pediatrician that there has to be a very significant background cause that needs to be urgently attended as against the PEM where generally you will have the issues like a gradual growth faltering over time. So it's a chronic process. It results in lowering of both weight and length, but the weight and length both are down, but the weight much more than length, of course. And maybe nutritional, especially in a small infant, or of course maybe secondary to disease itself. So whenever we are talking about a failure to trial, there is a little urgency in terms of finding the probable cause of failure to thrive as against the chronic process of malnutrition where it could be simply nutritional or you have some time on hand to pick up what's the chronic cause of a disease that has led to a malnutrition. And I think this is very, very important to begin with. So I'm not discussing causes of chronic malnutrition, but I'm discussing an issue that is likely to end up with chronic malnutrition and even fatality if we are not able to pick up quickly what is the situation. Now, the basis is that there is a progressive catabolic state that results in significant weight loss over a short time. Having said that, there are largely three major groups which ultimately are likely to cause a failure to thrive. The first and the foremost is, of course, a fastly progressive infection, even in an immunocompetent host. We today know that the infections are really a very, very complex situation simply because the manifestation of infection is really based on the changes occurring in the host, the organisms and the environment. And you can imagine all three factors are changing so much that gone are the days when we say TB is caused by a slowly worsening low grade evening temperature, all that is gone. And I think TB can really just come very fast and cause a failure to thrive. We need to be therefore aware today that no standard manifestations of any infection occur in actual practice, simply because the hosts are changing a lot and so also the organisms. Of course, there could be an opportunistic infection in terms of the immune deficiency disorder. And if you look at that, then there is a progressive organ dysfunction. Any chronic organ dysfunction uh, could come as a failure to thrive, and especially we are looking at the silent organ dysfunctions. For example, the renal dysfunction is often silent. The malabsorption could be very silent. There may not be a diarrhea at all. And immune deficiencies of kind will come, of course, with infection. Even the chronic adrenal disease, for example, could come very silently. And of course, the last one is, of course, the severe metabolic or functional defect. So when you see a FTT and you have confirmed that in a short time he has faltered a lot, you need to quickly decide whether he has an infection on hand 
whether he has an organ dysfunction as a major issue, or of course he has a metabolic or a, a functional defects of all kinds. Now, having said that, this is the basis, as I said, about the how these three major groups talk about. Having given this basic idea, what's the clinical approach of all this? Of course, the history. And I think I'll reiterate again today that history is the most important part of a clinician's armamentarium. You must be nearly sure 80% of the time what you are dealing with, with a good history. And that deals with automatically a focused physical examination. Because you already decided what you're going to look for in a clinical examination. And I think if you look at the history, we will not go much on detail because I'm sure all of us know this very, very well. And then, of course, the physical examination that you talk about. And uh, therefore, you would see that growth chart is the most important. I feel the difference between a quack looking after children and a pediatrician looking after children to me is only one. The pediatrician monitors growth chart and prevents the disease or prevents the growth failure. Whereas the quack treats only when the trouble comes. Therefore, all of us must have a growth chart. It is extremely important. You cannot be called a pediatrician if you are not monitoring growth. And I feel very sad to say that large number of pediatricians, successful pediatricians, gold medalists during their student days, forget the medal and do not even monitor growth. If you monitor the growth, the beauty of monitoring growth is you know origin, duration and progress of the disease simply by looking at the growth chart. And you don't have to really worry about when did the disease start, how did it progress, and I think the diagnosis of FTT can be made on the growth chart, how important it is. And I, I wish every one of us in this country, as a pediatrician, universally manage the growth chart. The moment you put the child on the growth chart, you are to explain why the growth is faltering. You are made to explain that. And I think it is best to be made to explain everything that we do. And a growth chart is the best thing. I would again end up by saying that let us all be true pediatricians and monitor growth. You will see how FTT can be picked up only by the growth chart, even if you did not know the symptoms. And I think this is very, very important. The rest of it, of course, we know very, very well. Important is how do you really interpret the whole thing. <clears throat> we know that the onset of problem is very important. It could be prenatal or postnatal. It could be at birth, it could be within a short time after birth, or it could be, of course, after days, weeks, etc. Again, a point is that growth chart would have told me all that, simply looking at the curve. What about the next thing, the progress? Again, it's important whether there is a constant deterioration or a transient improvement with again worsening. Again, the growth chart will tell me exactly that. It will show me that he deteriorated, but for, for a while he looked a little better, and he again deteriorated. What does that mean? He looked a little better because some intervention caused a temporary improvement. What intervention causes temporary improvement? Maybe the antibiotics worked and the infection got better for a while. Or a metabolic disorder, the child came with an acute onset disease, the child was kept nil by mouth, given intravenous fluids, taken away the oral feeds, the child seemed to improve biochemically for a while, and he goes home as a cured child only to come back again. The growth chart would tell me even the progress of the disease. And then, of course, the single or multiple organ involvement. We know that immune deficiencies and infections may be involving multiple organs. A metabolic disorders can typically involve multiple organs in a typical uh, constellation, like you might have a liver and the brain. You might have a liver and the kidney. You exactly know where we stand by deciding whether it's a single organ or a multiple organ. And of course, the evidence of infection that we know very well, and disseminated TB, for example, an immune deficiency coming as infection, a CF, cystic fibrosis, and all that would present really with infection as that. And of course, the non-infective disorders, which I've already said, either metabolic, or you have a chronic organ failures, or even sometimes just a primary nutritional as the cause of, of failure to thrive. Having said that, how a quick symptom science and the interpretation of all this comes up, again to reiterate the same message again and again, that growth chart is the most important. 
for everything that we do in pediatric practice. It is preventive, it is diagnostic, it is curative. What more do we want? How much time it takes? It takes hardly anything. And how much worth it is? It's tremendous worth. Even those who are busy can have somebody else take weight, height and all that. It's something that you can even pass it on to somebody. We don't need a perfect height like an endocrinologist need for a short stature and they worry about that. I was told by Dr. Vaman Kardilkar that the first week of endocrinology fellowship at Great Ormond Street was only to take height. And unless your height taken several times on a given child was near perfect, you did not start as an endocrinology fellow. We don't have to do that. We just want to know whether he's going up, down, etc. And I again feel that that's very, very important. Having said that, let's apply all this to uh, actual case scenarios. Now, this was a child who, two months old, presented with FTT, no other symptoms at all. When a small child comes with a failure to thrive, and if he had some infection on hand, a metabolic disorder on hand, some organ failure on hand, he generally would have had some symptoms. He was a hungry child and always wanting to feed and he was polyuric. Would a polyuria mean that he has a renal tubular defect? No, it won't because such a child would be anorexic. This child is hungry. If the child is hungry, this child is trying to tell you, doctor, don't search a diagnosis, feed me properly. If it was a polyura due to a renal disease, he would have come with anorexia and vomiting. Small simple clues to take up would obviously mean that this child is being fed outside milk, diluted milk, he's just taking water largely, and all that he needs is simply uh, nothing to do but a good, correct feeding. If this child gets on investigations, you will find that there's nothing that you're going to find. But the worst part of investigations today is that if every one of us goes through all investigations in science known, I'm sure every one of us is going to be abnormal. Tests are abnormal, but we are normal. We are concerned about our health and child's health and not the test. I know one of my schoolmates who is now a big executive told me the other day, that he went to the hospital for a routine check because his, his company decides that every top man must go through normal tests. And he told me that he went as a very healthy person to the hospital for routine check, but came out very unhealthy. I said, what happened to you? I thought he contracted some infection in the hospital. He said, no, no, I'm fit, but all my tests are abnormal. I said, no, treat the test, but not yourself. So the point is that if you had to investigate this child, you would have made a big blunder, and I think that's not right. Let's look at this one. Again, a small two-month-old, but he is breathless for us two days. The moment he's breathless, you start wondering, and in a hurry, you would start even oxygen. You need to know that every breathlessness is not respiratory, cardiac, or requiring oxygen, and if this child develops breathlessness in two days, what kind of breathlessness he had, and therefore, he had a tachypnea without chest findings. How important it is to know whether the child is tachypnic or distressed. A distressed child is cardiorespiratory maybe, and an irregular respiration may be neurological. But a tachypnea without respiratory distress is likely to be an acidosis, and of course this child had a metabolic alkalosis. Now if you wanted to see a metabolic acidosis in this child because of this story, but you ended up with alkalosis, so you know that there was a greasy stool also, and this was a child of a cystic fibrosis. You don't need a molecular diagnosis to confirm. Today, if you want a delta 508, the report will come and say, it's not delta 508, but there are many mutations, which will add to say, of which we don't know what is in India. Therefore, as clinician, we will have to use many other factors which will go by that. What about this case? A three-month-old infant presented with failure to try fever, abdominal distension, skin rash for us one. This child has fever. So this child is likely to be infection. I'm sure all of us know that fever could be inflammation as well. And inflammation could be infiltration, systemic inflammation, malignancies, what not. But the most common cause being infection. So this child is probably an infection and he has an abdominal distension. That means very likely as an organobagali. And he has also a skin rash. Looks like some disseminated infection. Physical examination showed a non-healing BCG site and a hepatosplenomegaly. 
you know if this is not healing and a child has a disseminated infection is it caused by the bcg vaccine itself the bcg bacillus itself and therefore this was a t cell defect it's so easy for a clinician to pick up a metabolic disorder or a immune deficiency and even subgroup them if an immune deficiency disorder is present in the first 3 4 months it is probably a severe defect a t cell defect a b cell defect doesn't present so early because the maternal transmitted immunoglobulins pre prevent for a while and the patient present over 3 4 5 6 months onset of the problem can tell you exactly i won't ask the immunologist to do the whole immunological profile i can know that this is mostly a t cell defect and a specific investigation can be possible in this child and therefore this was certainly just a kind of a b cell a t cell defect this was a four month old child who came with failure to thrive fever abdominal distension last two months similar the story looks very similar but look at what happened very sick looking febrile hepatospleromegaly again the same thing would this be an infection yes could be at this point of time we are not sure what it is because he looked exactly the like the previous one exact the difference was previous one had some clue to a t cell defect in terms of bcg not taken up but he had a, probably a progressive infection or inflammation we kept open could it be tuberculosis to get could it be histiocytosis could it be also the hls the lympho the hemolymphocytic hepatitis this is not an unusual condition today today we are faced with a problems of not infection alone but an infection to which the immune system of the host decides to act in a very weird way and present many immune complications this child therefore had probably all that but he was confirmed as tb imagine a small child coming with tb you wondered he should have gone into a tbm for all that you know but not necessarily everyone does that there would be a small infant who will hold on with a only a disseminated disease without firing off a meningitis simply because he doesn't have a strong immunity to fire off you need to fight the disease to also cause a destruction if the fellow doesn't fight he will not have destruction but he will have a slow worsening there would be multiple types of such presentations today therefore what about this child 5 month old jaundice and abdominal distension if this child has a jaundice and abdominal distension at this age certainly this is not simply a viral hepatitis or anything obviously this straight away looks like a metabolic disorder because if you see a liver disease with jaundice you are only three types largely infection as one immune system autoimmune hepatitis is another and a metabolic as third at this age you simply have a metabolic you want to know which other organs are involved is it the brain involved then is it maybe something carbohydrate like a, maybe a galactosemia or whatever does he have a seizure and if his kidneys are involved it's like a tyrosinosis and here's an enlarged liver spleen here's rickets if this child has failure to thrive and has rickets then i know that this is not a deficiency rickets this is very likely a resistant rickets and the commonest cause of resistant rickets is the renal malformation so this is a renal tubular defect this child has an involvement of the liver and kidney a metabolic disorder which comes at this age with involvement of liver and kidney is simply a tyrosinosis and one could tell the metabolic laboratory to say just check tyrosinemia how close diagnosis you can make even in a metabolic disorder and not just go on searching what the problems are what about this child 6 year old he's a big child now if a child that this age starts faltering then very unlikely he has any metabolic disorder so there are metabolic disorders or a neurodegenerative disorders which will come but they will probably not be so common as we see in a small child this child has a significant pallor enlarged spleen and liver and there is no icterus okay now you see this significant pallor and enlarged and liver and spleen you know that this is not likely to be simply a deficiency anemia deficiency anemia does not have a liver and spleen and this was therefore confirmed as kala azar again an infection which almost produces a failure to thrive and looks like often a malignancy this child improved of course because he developed also hlh and went further work this was the child 8 year old again ftt breathlessness over last four months painful swelling of two fingers 
If he has a pain swell, painful swelling of two fingers, localized swelling, take it as osteomyelitis. This child has the respiratory disease and an osteomyelitis. That straight away gives you a problem of a disseminated infection and again a biliary TB with bone involvement. I would just therefore talk a bit on management. You rarely have a specific therapy for an immune deficiency or metabolic disorders, but yes. Today I think the science is progressing and if you pick up a metabolic disorder very early, you have a chance to salvage him to some extent and I think that is still possible. Of course, bone marrow transplant, stem cell, things are coming up. Pediatricians have to know how to diagnose them early and of course the supportive therapy which we all know about. I'll just summarize to say that a failure to thrive can be diagnosed early by regular growth monitoring by maintaining growth chart. I think if you take this as a take-home message, I have served my purpose of coming here. And I wish from tomorrow, Tamil Nadu is a very progressive state. We know all over the country. If you all don't monitor growth chart, where do I tell people other than that to monitor? They would say even Tamil Nadu doesn't do it. That's the end of it. Okay. So I feel that you all must start doing that. And of course, it can help me. Cure may be possible in few situations. Every attempt must be made to improve quality of life, even if it's incurable. And I think index case must be diagnosed so that it helps the subsequent children. Thank you very much.